Is it? Okay, I gotta figure it out here. Thank you, Fiona. It's quite appropriate that you stack me between two scientists, okay? Because this is more uh, a discussion, I guess. I've been here for 37 years. I came here in 1980, and Don Bennick and I have a, have a connection there that we arrived within three days of each other in June of 1980, and uh, both of us have stuck it out. How many people here in this room were milking cows in 1980? A few. Ed was still in college. He's lying. <laughs> he was milking cows on the weekend. That's just anything. All I really needed to know, I learned in kindergarten. That's a very, very famous book. And basically, what I could say is, all I really learned. No, I learned from dairy farmers. Okay. Um, the overview of my discussion here. It's it's a discussion. It's a, I'm going to just tell stories. Okay. Is that all right? I'm going to try to sprinkle some science in there and probably some bullshit and all that. <laughs> oh, this is being recorded, right? So, dang, da Dave, where's Dave Bray? Dave, Dave left. So I'm going to go over some of my background, why I became a dairy vet and some of my heroes and mentors. Evolution of the dairy industry in Florida, which has been remarkable over the last 37 years. Talk about some science, some pseudoscience, and then some acknowledgments. Now, I'll start with this guy. One of my dad's best friends was a, was a veterinarian in town. Very respected guy, Dr. Mutri. And I'd go out with him on farm calls, and he was so respected by everybody, at least the people I was in contact with, which were beef producers, dairy producers, sheep producers. I never ventured into a small animal clinic for a good reason. <laughs> I, I milked cows in high school, just like I didn't own a farm. My parents didn't own a farm, but I milked cows in high school in my early college years. This is not the farm. This is the farm. Forty cows. The cows went out the back gate of the, the, the barn here. Look, there's a swimming pool right here. That, that happens to be the sister of the owner. And then that's the dad of the owner. So the cows, this was the pasture the cows were in. So we milked cows. Um, two things will teach you patience or break you of patience. One's feeding calves, right? And the second is milking cows with a bucket milker. And that's how I milked cows back in, in the 1970s. The other thing I learned when I worked on this farm, this building right here is not a dairy farm. That's a Baptist Bible college. And those young men at the Bible college would come and help us haying season. And we have a season in Canada called rock picking season. Anybody from the north? Rocks grow in the wintertime, right? <laughs> so in the spring, you go out there and pick the rocks out of the field. I learned how to curse. And those guys from the Bible College. I'd never. <laughs> I went to ag school in Nova Scotia. Um, first time I walked into this barn, 
I realized this is not for me. I, I like chicken, but no way can I work with chicken. I gravitated back to the cows. I was actually a physics and, and animal science major. Believe it or not, I loved physics. Um, but what I love more, what I, I degreed in basketball. I played basketball collegiately there for a couple of years, then went off to vet school in Ontario. And in, in, in vet school, we, they, we get the whole spectrum, okay? Dogs, cats, horses, cows, sheep, goats, all that stuff. And I had to do it, um, but I gravitated back to the cows. And my, my heroes, it's a short list. Of course, parents, right? Everybody in here has a, their parents are their heroes. The boss. <laughs> my wife. Couldn't have done it without her, nor him. I was given talents. I just had to use them. I had a couple of mentors, three actually. Bob Curtis was my first one. Really interesting guy. He had the patience of Job and was the most practical veterinarian I ever knew. And I've known a lot of veterinarians. He was a sheep rancher, a sheep rancher, sheep farmer in southern Ontario with a 300 cow feedlot. You want to lose money in agriculture? Go into sheep farming. Okay, you guys got it easy compared to them. But Bob was my mentor there. He got me my first job in Nova Scotia. He was a classmate of his looking for a, uh, somebody. So I went there and practiced in Nova Scotia. And then in 86, after I'd been here six years, he tried to recruit me to go to the University of Prince Edward Island up here. It took two days to get there because of a blizzard in the middle of February. Now, Bob. What the hell are you doing interviewing a dude from Florida in February, okay? So I said no when I stayed here. And then the Kens, the other two mentors are the Kens. Ken Leslie at the University of Guelph, he was nicknamed by the students the quiz machine. <laughs> he could beat you down like, like a, the best drill sergeant. Nice guy, though. He'd make you feel good about being stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but the best advice I ever received and this was not even direct advice, just a, a quote he, he had coming out the driveway one day after we were doing a dystocia, he and I on emergency. He says, I always ask myself coming out the farm gate, what else could I have done differently? And I've lived by that. Every day, I, I don't say it, but I'm thinking it. Every time I leave the farm. Good advice. And the other Ken, of course, most of you guys, many of you guys in here know Ken Braun, my mentor here. Um, that's him up there with, uh, we call this the Neanderthal necropsy team. Ken Braun and a couple of residents and myself when I had, before I had the students all whitened my hair. Okay? So, and then him working. But I don't know if any of you guys watch ESPN, but in the early parts of the 2000s through about 2010, there was a sports show on called The Best Damn Sports Show, period. And that describes Ken Braun. The best damn veterinarian, period. Amazing guy. And I'll talk about him a little bit later. In fact, Ken Braun, the first time I ever came to this conference in 1981, Ken Braun was here talking about milk quality. My philosophy is kind of built from those guys and from others I've encountered. I've been blessed to be encountered with a lot of people. When I was a kid, we were taught this. There's trains back then, there aren't any trains anymore. Boy, you, you stop, you look, you listen about trains, right? So one of the best quotes that Ken Braun, I remember from Ken Braun, that was meaningful, he had a lot of jokes too, but more things are missed for not looking than not knowing. And that was, it's so true. Especially as a veterinarian, you know, you're trying to investigate a problem, if you don't look for it, you're damn well not going to find it. And he received this from his mentor, Dr. Francis Fox at Cornell. And the other famous thing, the quote that I always comes back to my brain, is I don't know if any of you guys knew Earl Van Wagner. Earl was a dairyman down in Citra. And Earl was a mountain of a man in both personality and physical size. And we were down there, I was down there with Ernie Bliss one day, and Something pissed him off, and he says, you know what your problem with you gators is? No, what, Earl? 
They're all mouth and no ears. <laughs> so it taught me, hey, use your ears. Listen, observe, watch. The other influence about my philosophy was this guy. I don't know if you know who this guy is. This guy's, guy's named Louis Pasteur, French guy. Okay. Louis was the one that kind of developed the germ theory of disease, that disease is caused by bacteria and other things. And he really did a good job at, at setting this thing up and kind of organizing the science of diseases into all these disciplines here. And he's the one that carries his name, pasteurization, kind of put uh, the ability for us to market milk in, the, in a grand scale on the map. But those, all those other things he was involved with, too. Do I do believe in the germ theory of disease? Eh, kind of depends on the organism, on the disease. I, I, I got pounded into my head a long time ago, there's other things that cause disease than organisms. And I just have to show this slide, because if, if there's one thing I did in my career here, I think I did a good job on investigating calf things, okay? This particular slide, slide shows mortality risk in calves by serum total protein in that calf as a neonate. And you can see that if the calf doesn't receive colostrum, it's not going to do well, okay? If it see, receives lots of colostrum, it's going to do well. Well, there was a couple farms that I worked on back in the early 90s, I guess. And I looked at mortality in these calves based on t serum total protein. And we have a, this is a failure to pass some transfer calves. These are calves that got lots of colostrum, and these are kind of in the middle, kind of. And there's risks, generally, with these different levels. This particular farm, 4% mortality in the calves with failure to pass the transfer. And then the calves that are 5.1 and the greater than 5.4 had about the same mortality. Hmm, that's interesting. Look at another farm at the same time. This farm had much higher mortality. The take home message from this is that these calves in the intermediate range behave like these calves on this farm, whereas these calves in the intermediate range behave like these calves on an, this other farm. And the difference was management. Okay, it's not all it's black and white. Management can make a huge difference. Some people can't do anything right, and other people have the golden touch and everything works for them. Another question about the, do I just subscribe to the germ theory has to do with this slide. Okay, this is a slide of when calves die. This is a NOMS data from 1991. When do calves die? Okay, calves, this says that 15% of calves losses occur in the first week, 35% the second week, and then I want to focus on this one right here. The third month, so from 60 to 90 days, there's a secondary peak. And Ken Braun drilled it into my brain, and it took a little while, but it took, that a good bag of nutrition, and this is a sec Ken's second most common set thing he said, a good bag of nutrition will prevent more disease than the best vaccine. And any time I'm more investigating a disease outbreak, especially in calves, it's, it's finally gotten through to me after 37 years that look at nutrition first. All you people that are in the nutrition business, you got it, okay? You're in a very, very good position. So that's Ken Braun said that about 1991, working up a respiratory problem in post-weaning calves, and it's stuck with me ever since. Some of the lesson learned, lessons learned, Florida dairy industry's changed a lot. All right, when I came here, there was 456 farms, 10,000, 11,000 pound rolling herd average. Here we are today. It's changed tremendously. So we're only down to about 120 farms now. Um, production almost doubled. We went from, we'd like to call them dry lots, right? I don't know if there's a dry lot in Okeechobee County, is there? Uh-uh. There's one day a year, maybe. We, we went from this scenario, okay, cow cooling, 
Okay, well, I'm a veterinarian, not a photographer, so I'm sorry about that. But we've transitioned predominantly into some sort of housing system. Okay, that's, that's how things have changed over the last 37 years. When I came here, people were milking cows in Florida so they wouldn't have to build a barn. Cows could be outside all year round. And it, like the dairy unit, the old dairy farms, and you guys know better than I do, where did they put the farms? Where the grass grew all year. Where was that? Lowland. Swamp. So I'm just going to go over some, some diseases, some facilities changes, a little, tiny little bit of on, on feeding. Depends on how much time I have. But these are a list of some of the diseases I want to talk about. Okay? 1980, when I arrived here, this was the scourge of the dairy industry, in, or the cattle industries in Florida, both dairy and beef. There was a test and slaughter program. How many guys remember the Brucella program of the early 80s? Devastating to some farms, okay? So it was a test and slaughter. A lot of cows were being slaughtered. Because if a cow come up positive, she's gone. The farm's con, uh, quarantined. And along came Dr. Nicoletti. Paul Nicoletti was a, uh, a humble man from the Ozarks of Missouri. And what is the Missouri state? The show me state. You better have your ducks in a row if you're going to argue with that man. He was a first rate scientist. He knew the ins and outs of administration and, and bureaucratic BS. He'd, he'd been worked with USDA. He, was, he rallied the stakeholders. He could talk to dairymen. He could talk to ranchers. He could talk to politicians. He rallied those stakeholders, stood up to the politicians. In fact, he tells a story about standing up to the state veterinarian and setting them on his butt. He was stubborn as hell, and he wouldn't take no for an answer. And his quote was, brucellosis is an infectious disease, controllable infectious disease propagated by politicians. So he got the vaccination programs going in this state, and it was a rapid cleanup of brucellosis in this state after he went to work. IBR. Anybody ever seen a case of IBR? Look at all those hands go up. When I first came to Florida, IBR was prevalent, okay? I haven't seen it in 20 years. And that was probably because of the, the hard work of Ken Braun. IBR causes respiratory problems and abortion. Ken did his master's degree work on, Brussel, on uh, IBR vaccines when he was at California. He said, this is a vaccinatable disease too. Let's get out there and vaccinate and let's not worry about the piss and match between killed and live and all that stuff that was going on back in the 80s. And let's just get them vaccinated. And he really solidified the ability of farmers in Florida to raise their own calves. At that time, most animals were imported. And again, focus on nutrition. This, anybody ever seen this on their farm? Yeah, 1985, I remember being at a farm with, with, with Ernie Bliss. And Ernie and I were seeing these cases of this stuff and we're going, what the heck is this? The typical treatment for foot rot wouldn't work injectable penicillin, wrap the foot with whatever, it didn't seem to work. We even went to the, the one thing we found would work, if we applied a hot iron to this. Now you can imagine how sore that is. So welfare wise, we weren't thinking about stuff like that. But one thing we could do is we could put a hot iron to this and it seemed to just stimulate something and then those things went away. But boy, what a hard way to treat, treat an animal. We, other things wouldn't work very well. And along came, comes Jan Shear, another colleague, that found out that hoof spraying and formaldehyde baths would do a pretty good job controlling this. And then, really, in the bottom line was, any foot bath will work as long as you use it. Foot baths that are over in the corner, without anything in them, they don't work. This problem, I think I brought this from north. We never saw this. Titus Media, you guys, the calves, the droopy-eared calves? Well, we first started seeing this about 87 on, on a couple farms. And we thought it was, we thought it was trauma. We thought, you know, those bozos in the, in the milk truck, the milk wagon are coming by and hitting these calves on the side of the head. Maybe one, two, three a year. And then all of a sudden it just started hitting an epidemic level. And we read about Parasites, maybe ticks and mites in the ear might cause this. So with the help of a lot of people, Gina Temple, 
Jack Gaskins, Mary Brown here at the university, we found that it was caused by Mycoplasma bovis, which we know now. What we also found was transmission is not likely by these means. The calf is not infected in the birth canal, likely. The calf is not likely infected by nasal secretion from mama, as, as it's making, doing mama things. And it's not likely from colostrum. We can't seem to find it in colostrum. It's most, transmission is predominantly through milk. So we were able to define, now that we knew what was going on, we were able to define early clinical signs. We were, I was able to do this because a dairy farmer in Florida gave me 10 calves. He says, okay, you got these 10 bull calves. We got a calf with hepatitis. We housed it with those calves. And the first signs that these calves had a fever, we euthanized them. Did necropsies, did cultures, did all that stuff. And that's how we found out what caused all this. So the, the farmers help again. We learned that treatment, anything but cephalosporins and sulfas, but we need a long duration of treatment to be effective. And prevention, avoid waste milk predominantly, but also ventilation, nutrition, and sanitation are important. What about vaccination? Fiona Manso did some work with vaccines a couple times. Really, our contraindicated the vaccines that are available don't work and may even set the calf up for higher risk of, of sickness. Bloody gut. Anybody on this? See bloody gut in their farm? Yeah? No? Well, in about 98, we started seeing this syndrome, dead cow syndrome, and where there was a crash in milk followed by death. And we started doing necropsies on these and found things. This is a, the only slide I have of a bloody gut during surgery. So this is a sausage of blood in the jejunum. Uh, most of the time, you can't get that sausage out of there when we're doing surgery. So that's bloody gut. We have no idea what it was. This, nobody had ever seen this before. So again, a farmer allowed me to go to a slaughterhouse, to follow 10 cows that were suspect bloody gut. So I went to the slaughterhouse down in Center Hill. Anybody here ever been in a slaughterhouse before? Well, you have about 30 people with knives. And none of them have a PhD. <laughs> Nothing against PhDs, but I get in there and started following these cows through the slaughter facility. And the first cow that came in on out of the, off that farm into the slaughterhouse after she's done, I heard this cursing. Well, when they opened her up, they they slashed into an abscess. And when that happens, the line stops. They disinfect everything, clean their knives. The second cow comes in the same thing. I'm sitting in a, I've got a spot about as big as a potion stamp that I'm standing in watching all this because that's a pretty tight spot. And about the seventh cow, all these 30 knives were looking at me. I didn't see any eyes. I saw knives. I thought they were going to kill me. <laughs> but what we found were a bunch of abscesses. We thought it might be hardware disease. I've got this little spot right here and, and the guts come by me and I've got 20 seconds to make an evaluation and move on. So. We thought it might be hardware, but it was odd. We saw lungs, and, and I didn't want to have a whole lot of gruesome pictures in this, but I had to show two, okay? Lungs that had abscesses like that that smelt like a rotten placenta. Wow, this is crazy. And we, we found that these were result from bacteria escape from the small intestine down near where all this problem is occurring. And as the bacteria escape and get, go up through the lymph channels and up into the lung, we get these nasty abscesses. What we're able to do is we try to define earlier detection. Only do that by daily milk weights because cows can go from 35, 40 pounds one milking to two the next. And that's probably the first sign she's sick. Okay. We looked at surgical treatment about the same time. This was happening all over North America, and people were putting in their ideas. So we had surgical treatment. We had medical treatment. So we did surgical treatment on a bunch of cows. The worst year was 2006. We had 152 cases of bloody gut in our practice. So by default, we became experts in this. It really sucked. 55% survival rate through surgical intervention. Medical treatment, 45% death rate. 
So you guys are quick on the math over here, <laughs> okay? There wasn't any difference. So obviously we quit doing surgeries. We just medically treat these and with Epsom salts and mineral oil, pray to God. And we get, my God, we get Saeed to pray to his God, everybody the same God, but we come from different directions and some of these cows made it. What was the cause? Still don't know. What to do to prevent what we do think Silage quality has a lot to do with it, especially wet silage. So there's something in wet silage that sets this up. Is it Clostridium? Is it um, fungus? We, nobody really been able to put their finger on it. But it seems to be silage quality and high starch feeds seem to have some predisposing um, qualities about them. Mastitis. Okay, I'm glad Gordy's here. Because when I would go to a meeting, the ABP, American Association of Bovine Practitioners meeting in the early 80s, I'd get laughed at by the veterinarians up north. <laughs> milk quality, Florida? No, nah, it's not. You shouldn't have it in the same sentence, right? Because milk, to them, they would come down here and consult with the dairy farms. Milk quality was keeping milk legal. Well, again, I said in 1981, 20, 36 years ago, Ken Braun was standing right here talking about milk quality. So they're trying to promote it. We put on milker schools. We did parlor checks. We evaluated milk and equipment, parlor performance. We did cultures and all that stuff. And I'm not trying to downgrade the importance of these things because what happens in here, it's really important. But just think about it. The time spent in the parlor versus time spent not in the parlor. A cow will spend four to five minutes, two to three times a day being milked. The rest of the day she's in somewhere else. If I'm a betting man, I'm thinking the rest of the day might be just as important as the parlor. Okay? So Dave Bray, where is Dave? Is he in here? He was here earlier. He must have skipped out. Son of a gun. <laughs> Dave Bray. If you guys any, ever had Dave Bray on your farm, talk about milk quality, and they were colorful reports that you got. They're they hilarious. But Dave would often say, and I'm paraphrasing, the germs that cause mastitis now are the same ones that caused it in the 1940s, and we've got to move on out of that level of management. So facilities were the first major step forward. You know, when, when Don Bennett first put cows in cooling ponds, everybody says, you've got to be crazy. You know, you, 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 you put fences around the ponds. You know, is this better than that? Probably. So that evolved. Uh, then a lot of farms started using cooling ponds. Some still use them today. Uh, where are we now? Again, we moved out of those wet lots into barns. And that kind of brings a whole level of management that had to be overcome. So where are we now? It has to do with housing. Has to do with bedding. People try to use mattresses. Cleaning the barns, rebedding barns, all that came into play now. And this guy here, just to, this is just a reminder of, I don't know how many farms I've been on. I go in here after the scraper's been through, and, and the wake thrown up by that scraper blade is just perfect for just saturating the back of those stalls. And it's really a numbers game when it comes to mastitis. How many bacteria on the end of that teat? Okay, I'm starting to talk like a Yankee now and speeding up. I've got 20, 20, 10 more minutes. Um, this is some data, two years worth of data from one of our farms that shows that there's a peak in cases of mastitis diagnosed on Sunday and Wednesday. Yeah, that could be random, right? Well, it's interesting that they rebed free stalls on those two days. So look at the days after the day they re redid the freestalls. There's a decrease in mastitis occurrence in those days after bedding freestalls. And then I said, well, what's the difference between summer and winter on this farm? And there's a hell of an effect of rebedding freestalls twice a week in the summer. So when this is the day they rebedded and Incidence went down. It popped back up when the beds got a little dirty, came back down. In the wintertime, it didn't seem to have much of an effect at all. Now, I'm not promoting 
betting freestalls once a week at all. Crypto. A lot of people made a lot of money on crypto. Diarrheal disease of calves, every calf in Florida gets affected, every calf in Florida gets diarrhea, guaranteed. When do calves die? Well, I showed these slides earlier. This is over a period of uh, 30 years, 25 years or so. Calves die young. When does crypto occur? Crypto occurs when calves are under two weeks of age. So is there an association between crypto and this high mortality? Maybe. Um, the cost of crypto is basically treatment, electrolytes. Some people put them on antibiotics. The comorbidities probably, meaning the calves of crypto are more likely to get septicemia and other, you know, E. coli, rotavirus, whatever. And then there's a the nuisance factor. In some farms, it's just a nuisance. It's a fly magnet, um, just a pain in the butt. These calves have diarrhea, they're doing well, but they have diarrhea. So what can you do about it? Well, what we try to do about it is we tested a lot of products. Not these ones. These are some of the antibiotics that have been used. They're either not effective or way too costly to use in a practical sense. The antiparasiticides or the coccidiostats, okay? People were promoting Bovitec in the 90s as a treatment for crypto. Well, the difference, LD50 means that's the level of drug that will kill half the animals. The LD50 is only two times the therapeutic dose. So if you're using Bovitec on your farm, if you double that dose, there's a good chance you'll kill half the calves. So this is a very, very unsafe product to use. Decox, study out of Ohio said, man, this stuff works like white bread, you know? Well, we tried it here, and there was an effect. The orange bars are the, are the severity diarrhea, diarrhea score zero is, is normal, three is real watery. So it decreased the severity of diarrhea using both uh, decox, and decox M is the one we used in this project. Is that enough to be concerned about spending the money on it? That's a different question. Activated charcoal and with vinegar, Dr. Sims over here did part of this project a few years ago. This is not going to Walmart and buying a bag of charcoal, okay? This is a specific charcoal out of a specific plant that contains wood vinegar. And we did this study, and this, this graph for the use, you in the cheap seats in the back, you can't see it, but this is um, cryptosporidium oocyst grams per gram of feces. So it peaks out here in the control group at 10 to the 5.5, so about 400,000 cysts per gram. So they shed a lot of these things. Um, treatment with the wood vinegar decreased it down to about 100,000 and then tailed off and nobody's shedding by 21 days. One of the problems with this product is palatability. This ch chart shows treatment. This is appetite score, so a, a, a one appetite score is good. A four appetite score is bad, okay? So the calves on the, on the product, on the, that charcoal, maybe they didn't like the color of their milk because it was black, but they didn't there's something about the taste. They didn't take it in very well. So that was a problem with that. Herbals and essential oils we've never worked on, but some people have promoted this as an organic uh, therapy for crypto. We did do a project with aloe vera. Aloe vera is supposed to cure everything um, except old age, unfortunately. There are no effect of treating calves with aloe vera juice. And then a vaccine. There was a vaccine uh, developed at NC State that looked like it was unbelievable. Um, yeah, it was. So we tried it here, and this is where, you, because this happens so early in life, you have to vaccinate the cow. So we vaccinated the cow, fed hyperimmunized colostrum to calves. And the only thing that we saw statistically significant was number of days oocysts shedding from about 12 days to 10 days. Probably not practical. Um, didn't really show much efficacy on clinical disease. And then disinfectants. There's a whole list of disinfectants here. And if you can pronounce them all, you get a, an A in this class. Um, 
all these are pretty tough on people. Okay, in order to kill crypto, you pretty well have to fumigate a barn, empty it and fumigate. How to treat, what can you do about it? Maximize sanitation, feed the heck out of them. Okay, high quality nutrients. And in this case, I think milk works pretty good as a, as a nutrient. I got about two minutes, five minutes? Two minutes, okay, housing. We're not gonna house the gators on Florida field, the cows on Florida field. A little bit about heat stress, probably not, don't need to go here much, but Bob Collier and Bill Thatcher and those guys in the early 80s were working on this and what their results showed was we probably can do better than that. And th this could be big, okay? And we we've we've, we've put people to work. Uh, Jake Martin back there got a lot of work out of heat stress abatement, okay? And done a really good job of designing facilities that aren't this. Okay? These sorts of things. And, and the one common denominator in all these pictures pretty well is what? Fans. Fans are important, right? Fans are really important <laughs> when it comes to cooling cows. And when we started housing cows, we have to start th thinking about cow comfort. Okay, what, what is a comfortable place to lay? Okay, what's, what's good? What's bad? How do we measure it? And we tell the students, go lay down that freestall. See, tell me if it's, if it's comfortable or not. Is that comfortable? So then we transition into welfare assessments on cow comfort. Okay? We can't make assessments on this. When we do welfare assessments, and Jeff, I saw Jeff here, that did a lot of these just recently. We don't go out there to tape measure and measure how many cows are laying down, standing up. We do it on assessments of like hawk lesions, lameness scores, outcome assessments. So they're very, very important. We did one study looking at lying behavior of cows on different lying surfaces. And this is sand, black is gel mats, and, and blue is water beds. And I got to thank Eric the dairy unit for allowing us to do this study. You know, this is 13 hours a day cows lie down in sand. Three hours less on those other, other surfaces. So that's important in preventing lameness and allowing that cow's immune system to rest instead of having her standing and working all the time. And then calf housing. And I only got a couple minutes on this, but I think my wife's a cat veterinarian, and this has nothing to do with what I'm going to say, but I think we need to listen to what the cats have to say. Because some veterinarian back in the early 80s says, you know, we need to get calves out of the barns and get them out here. All right? So a lot of dairymen said, okay, let's move them out because the vet said so. Because we want to get away from this. Calf to calf contact, disease transmission. Put them out here so there can't be possible disease transmission. But boy, there's some good things about in a barn for people. All right? Out here is a tough environment for the people and sometimes for the calves. So we listen to the cats. Where do the cats hang out? They don't go out in these pens outside. This is a facility where they put some pens under an equipment shed. And geez, these calves did pretty good. And the cats hung out there too. And then we transitioned to what the dairy unit's got now. And lastly, about group housing. Now we say, well, let's bring them outside. Let's take them into group housing situation. <coughs> Well, if anybody's done that, anybody in here got any group housing? I know Ed does. A challenge, right? Okay, we take them inside, we put them in group housing. Um, just an example of a farm that transitioned from calf barn to group housing. So this is a farm that decided about December of 2013 they're going to put in group housing. So there's a planning situation. By, this is pre-wearing calf mortality, about 3%. Good, bad, and different. Eh, reasonable, right? It's okay. Okay, so right there, they got the housing done. They started putting calves in this barn in late April 2014. Okay, well, summer's coming, so maybe that's okay. And then July hits. There's a whole new mindset when you put calves in group housing systems. Okay, we did some educational things and 
farm worked real hard on different things, and we got it back down to almost pre-group um, housing mortalities. And the key is this. How many eyes in sanitation? Jonathan, this is the test. Two, right? How many T's in sanitation? Well, I tell you what. If you don't cross them and dot them, you're going to be in trouble when it comes to sanitation in these, these group housing. And that's sanitation of the bedding, sanitation of the milk handling equipment, all the way through. Okay, and I think that's probably about all the time I've got. Let me go just... I, I even tried to put, sprinkle some science in here. <laughs> okay, where are we now? We've got herds with tremendous, we don't have 36,000 pound herd averages like Michigan, but we've got herds well over 28,000. We've got somatic cell counts under 200,000 a year, easy, every month of the year, every week of the year. Clinical mastitis rates, less than two cases per 100 cows per, per, per month. Very, very much lower than that. Pregnancy rates above 22%. Call rates below 30%. Calf mortality rates less than 3%. We've you guys have come a long way. You're the survivors. You know how to do it right. Now, why the heck didn't I talk about reproduction? Because change is slow, and I'm slower, okay? And I, this is how slow reproduction is, okay? A few years ago, I went out to Utah, and these are petroglyphs in some rocks at Courthouse Rock in southern Utah near Moab. And these things were put, carved into the rocks about 1650. Three, almost 400 years ago. Well, one of those petroglyphs is this. The Native Americans have been studying reproduction for 400 years, and how much progress have we made? Okay, I'm not the one to talk about repro. But I want to acknowledge the, uh, the team that put this program together. It was an awesome program. Thank you very much, guys. And I want to thank my families. The first one's you guys, Florida dairy farmers. You've given me an opportunity to work with some of the best people on the planet. Um, you've gave me impetus to learn Spanish, okay? Um, no, you've really been helpful in, in cooperating with me, and hopefully I've, you've learned something from me like I've learned from you. My colleagues like Fiona and, and Clibs and those guys that allowed me to have two other jobs. One's a family, and second, I was a softball coach for 11 years, and uh, every afternoon around 4 o'clock I'd disappear. But I'd start early, okay? My colleagues on the farm, you Nate, Saeed, and all these guys, Eric, all the people doing the work, most of them have names like Luis and Carlos and uh, Maria. And then the real deal. Last slide, I promise, <laughs> is this slide. I had to take this slide when I was in Chile. This is an ox cart. The guy carrying potatoes, the guy was no bigger than this big, this skinny, carrying those 50 kilo bags of potatoes into the equivalent of the 7-Eleven in Chile. And these sandals they have on the feet of these cows, these steers, to uh, keep them from wearing their feet out. And it was such an innovative thing that they've done, they've improvised. And that quote on the top, anybody in this room recognize that quote? That quote is the unofficial motto of the United States Marine Corps. It should be the official motto of dairy farmers in the world, okay? You guys are the masters of improvisation, adaptation, and overcoming all obstacles. Thank you.